Hello, everyone, and welcome to another month's Sharing Hope Community Conversations. My name is Nimade, and I am NAMI Delaware's Diversity and Equity Fellow. Um, I'm so excited to bring another Sharing Hope. We do these the last Thursday of each month about different topics um, that affect us and our mental health, um, focusing especially on the BIPOC community. Um, tonight, we are having a conversation. It's June, so it's Pride Month. So tonight we are having a conversation about gender identity. Um, and I have some great guests with me this evening. Um, I have Queen, Dr. Freeman, and Reverend Scott. Um, and if you would each like to take a moment to just introduce yourselves. Queen, you can start since you're to the left. Not a problem. Hello, uh, everyone. I am Lena Queen. Uh, my pronouns are they and Queen. I am the owner of Journey Wellness and Consulting Group, which is a somatic psychotherapy and a somatic sex therapy practice. Um, in addition to the founder of the Whole Self Healing Institute, which is in training and healing um, platform uh, and or centering Black sexual healing. Thanks. Hi everyone, I am Dr. Kiana Freeman, I'm the founder and owner of Freely Life Services for Individuals and Families Incorporated, which is a nonprofit organization that assists BIPOC women and LGBTQIA plus folks. I'm the owner of Freely Integrated Health Wealth, which is a holistic healthcare practice that integrates um, mental wellness and physical wellness and healing. Um, I am also a contracted outpatient psychotherapist for Journey Wellness working under Queen. Um, he is the supervisor there. Um, so hello, everyone. Awesome, thank you. Hello, everyone. I'm Reverend Brooke Scott. Um, I'm new to the Delaware area. I'm the pastor at Church on Main, uh, which is a small worshiping community in Middletown, Delaware. And I also work in Wilmington, focusing more on alternative spirituality outside of church spaces, focused on healing and liberation. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Awesome, and thank you all so much uh, for agreeing to join. Um, so we last, we've been running Sharing Hope Community Conversations for a while now, which is very nice, um, but it also means that we're cycling through. And I know last year, um, Dr. Freeman, you joined us and Queen as well, um, where we had our LGBTQIA uh, conversation for pride. Um, so this month, and I just mentioned that, um, because it is a great conversation and it is saved. If anyone's watching this later, you can go back and see last year's as well. Um, this year, I'm going to focus a little bit more on gender identity because I feel like it's a conversation that um, a lot of people are confused about. They're not sure about pronouns. They're not sure about um, trans and what exactly that means. Um, so, you know, I just like to ask some basic questions around that. And if you have anything that you want to add as well, that would be most helpful. Um, so let's start with the basics, which are pronouns. What are pronouns? Why do we care about pronouns? Why do we need to have them identified? Um, and anyone can answer. So pronouns are an identifying, uh, a, a identifying nominator for individuals um, that normally indicate their relationship to their gender. Um, what, what we are discovering, not even what we're discovering, what we're practicing. First, when we think about gender identity and defining gender identity, right? The American Psychological Association talks about, defines gender identity as like thoughts, attitudes, and beliefs um, that a person has um, uh, in addition to, uh, that a person has and in addition to what society expects based on a person's sex at birth. Um, what we're what we have been rediscovering in in this generation, particularly with the visibility, is that people are recognized that gender is more than our genitalia, right? We are female and male are actually medical terms for secondary and primary reproductive organs, and it's not just it's not gender, it's not just it's not gender. So when we're talking about pronouns, what we're talking about is an indication of an individual saying 
you know, I do not agree with the gender that I was assigned at birth or agree with the gender I, I was assigned at birth. And these pronouns, my pronouns are an indication of my identity um, and not something that society or, or, or parents have assigned to, to myself as a person. So it's really a person really being able to reclaim their personhood and that's why those pronouns are so important. Absolutely. Um, and Dr. Freeman, to add on to that, when um, people are at a phase where they think they may want to change their pronouns, is that a conversation that you have with them? And, and how does that go, trying to sort of help them with that transition? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Gender identity um, is fluid. Um, I'm not sure if any, everyone else can hear you. I'm having trouble hearing. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Thank yeah, you. you can hear me. Okay. Um, I, I said absolutely it's a conversation that is had because gender um, is, is fluid and um, I can be she, her today and decide that, you know what, this doesn't work for me. Um, I want to uh, present as they, them. Um, or he, him, right? So, um, and, and the conversations that we have is you can absolutely uh, present as whom, whomever it is that you choose, uh, that you wanna be, right? How, however you feel, and it's okay. Uh, and when we talk about pronouns, um, we talk about how does one identify what a person's pronouns are because we don't necessarily present as we, um, as we are, as our pronouns, you know, uh, describe who we are. So um, we say ask, right? What are your pronouns? Something very basic, something very simple. It's a way that um, brings in an inclusive environment, shows respect in a more inclusive and accepting culture. Yes, absolutely. And I like that people are getting better about using those pronouns. And it's always weird to me when people get in like a huff about it because it's like, what does it matter? Like if that's what they want to be called, that's what they want to be called. Um, now I do know a lot of people will um, quote the Bible and you know, saying, saying how you were born and things like that as reasons why. Um, so like Reverend Scott, when you um, come across that, like how do you help people who maybe want to have the faith but are also have also been raised thinking that this was all bad and wrong. Yeah, it's a good question. And I think there are different ways of answering it depending on where people are. Um, as a pastor, I try to meet people where they are. And a lot of people have different reasons for why it's hard for them to understand. I think for some people, it is quoting the Bible. They don't see it um, in a literal way. Um, and so in those cases, sometimes it's sitting with people and breaking down all of the passages that people commonly use to condemn um, different sexual orientations or different gender identities. Um, and really just breaking down like the context that those were written in, the fact that when the Bible was written, people really didn't have a sense of, you know, what we consider um, these categories today. Um, and that even if they would have known um, you know, what we know today and condemned it, we can move on, you know, like the scripture can actually be a springboard and something that we can disagree with and change our mind about as we learn more. Um, so sometimes it's that, sometimes it's the simple, just educating people on science and research and on the changing times and communicating to them that if we really are, you know, living, in a way that's loving our neighbor, then that is a part of it to show our love and concern. So just depending on what the, what the issue is, um, those could be different conversations, but those are a couple that I go to. No, those are, those are really good. Um, I think that having those conversations would at least help open things up to discussing more and for people to sort of try to figure it out. Um, I know that the age when people start to either gender identify or sexually identify, whatever it is, is different for everybody. Um, but I know that in Florida right now, for example, they're really trying to put a ban on people talking about those things at a young age. Um, so my question, I guess, for, for Queen is, um, as a therapist, like what is a good age to start talking to kids about that? Or is there even an age? 
Um, so research shows that, you know, children can identify their gender identity as early as the age of three. The Don't Say Gay bill in Florida and the other bills in almost, I think, 18 states that have been brought, brought to task, um, Florida being one that, that's passed that, it really um, outlaws gender identity or sexual education in elementary age kids and then, you know, penalizes um, older kids and middle school and high school kids. So, you know, the, the age is as soon as possible, as soon as they can understand concepts, right? You are introducing them to a world of, of gender. When you think about child, early childhood development, right? Um, you know, between zero and five years old, they are they are trying to make sense of their inner and outer world. By the time they're three and five years old, they're communicating their inner and outer world. My granddaughter who's sitting right here beside me, like she was Simba at three. You know, um, so as early as your child, um, given intellectual cognitive ability, understands the concept of gender is when you should be talking about it. Um, as soon as they, you know, if you're teaching them about their eyes and their ears, you should be teaching them about their penises and their vulvas. Um, they should have access to medically accurate information because, you know, research also shows when you have access to medically accurate, accurate information for youth, they're less likely to be harmed. They're, they're more likely to um, delay their sexual debut. So that's a really good question because it starts these other questions. And it really is as soon as they're able to comprehend like the world around them, teach them so that way others aren't. And I think it's really interesting that you mentioned that it sort of delays their sexual debut because I think the reason a lot of people avoid it is because they think it's going to prompt them, right? Like, oh, if I talk about this, then they'll be curious and then they'll go out and try things. And um, it's great knowing the research behind, um, you know, as far as like when kids identify with their age, I think it's unfortunate that laws are passed uh, by people without, you know, medical degrees or who haven't seen therapists or who aren't therapists in regards to things that the kids need. So um, I always think that's unfortunate. Absolutely. Fear has a way of driving things. And what you're seeing right now is really some fear-based legislation, a fear of the unknown, fear of lack of information. So what we're really talking about in this, even just having this conversation, right, is being able to provide people with information so that way they can make informed consent. And that's what comprehensive sex education does for all of us. You know, it's an always an ongoing process that it allows us to have information. So we always have, you know, scientifically accurate, medically accurate information to make informed choices. It's the basis of consent 101. Yeah, and it's even, you know, from the mental health aspect, um, it's been shown that um, kids who are able to, you know, identify as they are from a younger age, it, it helps them um, mentally as well. Uh, correct, Dr. Freeman? Uh, you're muted again. I'm not muted. Can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. You know, it has to be a delay on my end. I am so sorry. It does. It decreases the um, risk factors that are related to not um, being able to walk in your truth, right? So the risk factors that are related to this community, which include suicidal ideation, um, substance abuse, housing instability, um, violence, intimate partner crime, even gang culture, right, is now related, is um, being associated with the LGBT, LGBTQI plus um, community, um, folks who feel like at a very young age, they weren't able to be who they are, folks who feel like at a very young age, they weren't supported in, um, in any way. There are so many different risk factors that are related to that. And as parents, you know, I think, uh, I, well, I'm not a parent, Thank you, Jesus. But for the parents out there, um, if they start to see maybe signs that their their child might be curious or thinking or not really sure, um, what are some ways that they can approach that conversation? I always say be a tellable adult. I know we talk about be an askable adult, and it's really along the same line. One, breathe, right? kids are naturally curious because they want information. And remember, we don't have to adultify the information people give us. You know, it's always good to say, you've asked a really good question and I'm not sure how to answer that right now. 
but let's go ahead at some time and talk about it and then commit to that, right? Commit to like taking some time to get some information um, and then going back to that young person with information. So that would be the first place I would have, I would say start, you know, first take a breath. You don't have to, as we talk about the word understand, they don't have to understand per se, right? We can scaffold a, a child or a person's understanding. So take a breath first, figure out what you know, what you don't know. If you need to table it, give yourself permission to table it and, and honor the person's request, the child's request to say, I hear you and I wanna make sure I honor that question by making sure I give you information, let's talk about it. And, and then follow up with that commitment. And that's why I would say it's to start. And just to piggyback off of Queen, um, if it's a space that you feel really uncomfortable with and you genuinely don't know how to navigate it, well, then there we have resources, right? Um, consult a therapist if you have one or um, organizations like NAMI and Journey Wellness that are very inclusive and gender affirming, um, you know, get a professional uh, that can help you with navigating that conversation. Absolutely, and those are great tips. Um, I wanted to ask you, Reverend Scott, because a lot of times, especially people who grow up, especially uh, religious, tend to think that they're doing something wrong because that's how they've been raised. Um, and I actually, on my YouTube, had a conversation about the documentary, uh, Pray Away, um, where we talked about conversion therapy, which is a disaster. But um, as far as on the religious side of things, like how do you speak with someone or help with someone who feels like they're doing something wrong and maybe they should be trying to change who they are? Yeah, I think I would respond similarly is equipping people with as much information and resources as possible. I think also for a lot of our folks who um, have questions or are, you know, just, trying to understand themselves better. They have a lot of shame and they have a lot of um, programming that needs to be undone. And so a lot of my work with, with people who have had an, a religious upbringing or their faith is really important to them, a lot of it is just reiterating, like you were created like this. This is, you know, something divine about you. This is not, um, sinful this is not dirty this is not you know like people just need to hear that over and over and over again because it's so programmed into me I mean I know for me as a pastor I'm also queer identifying and I've had to work through that um and so I know how much you need to hear it and how much it can creep up so you know I think we need to do as much as we can as faith leaders to push beyond you know um, hate the sin, love the sinner, all of that. It's, you know, it's not just that you are loved, but it's that, or that you are loved in spite of this, but you are loved because of this. This is something that makes you unique. This is something that makes you beautiful and divine and something that you can add to the world and, you know, is a part of what I believe that God painted into the world. Um, and so I think, as much as people can hear that, to keep saying that and to connect them with people. Um, and I like to have fun with scripture too, because I think that gender identity and different sexual orientations have always existed. And so I like to play around with stories that I think um, that church folks have been afraid to point out uh, where there was gender fluidity or where there was um, same sex relationships. And so I feel like using the scriptures in that way can also be affirming because they feel like it's still something that's important to them, but used for liberation rather than the harm. So that's what I would do. Yeah, I love that. I love that because there are some people who, you know, just because suddenly you identify a certain way doesn't change your, your upbringing and your religion. And even, you know, some people who may have went through like a disgruntled phase with organized religion, that doesn't necessarily mean they lose their faith in God. So I think it's great that there's other avenues where they can still have that relationship, but not be afraid of who they are. Yeah. And I think I would also add, you know, I, so for some people, the trauma, which really is what it is for a lot of people, uh, is so deep that the church is not going to be the place where 
they're going to find the healing. And so I'm also happy to say that sometimes my pastoral care is helping people find places outside of the church, helping people leave churches. And I'm open to that. Sometimes it's just too deep and it can't be um, reconciled. And I'm also open to that um, being maybe necessary for somebody's path. Um, but also if it is important to them, there's ways we can work through that. Um, so whatever people need. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so one of the things, you know, I, I mentioned we're talking gender identity. Um, sometimes people get confused on the difference between um, like a transsexual and someone who's transgender because they are two different things. Um, would one of you be able to explain the difference for everybody? Uh, Queen? Yes. Normally, I don't use this TS word um, because that is something very specific to the trans community. Um, the TS word is a, an adjective or an identifier to an individual who has had gender affirming surgery um, mm -hmm. uh, and the, uh, who is still a, a transgender person who does not identify with their gender assigned at birth. Um, it's just that they have had an additional. Um, gender support, um, medical support uh, process. And a transgender person is just a, is a person who does not identify um, or does not agree with their gender assigned at birth. I always tell folks like cisgender and transgender are adjectives to the person describing their personhood. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so when you think of transgender person as the person who is telling you that, you know, I am, I am more than, I am more than my genitalia. I don't agree with the gender that I was assigned at birth and a TS person is someone in the trans community who's received gender affirming care medically. Okay. Um, okay, so the basically the, the synopsis is um, transgender might be, I'm trying to figure out the best way to phrase it that's also not like insensitive. Um, so like transgender is anyone who just identifies as different than what they are, but are pre-op. And then once they have um, medical um, changes, then they become TS? Only if they identify as so, right? Okay. Um, only if they identify as so. A transgender person who has, um, who try, first, you do not have to engage in any type of medical, legal, or social transition to be a transgender person. Mm -hmm. um, so let me say that first. Um, secondly, uh, no, not necessarily. So those two things are, don't necessarily have to have a relationship with each other. Um, so it's not where someone is moving towards being a certain thing. It is just, again, how someone really identifies. It would be no, um, the TS, I would say, would be very similarly to a person um, who is queer, who's saying I'm more than gender, just telling you like more about where they are in their journey um, and then again, that can be a, a, an identity, but they're not always necessarily correlated together where a person who is transgender will identify as someone who is TS. Okay, that makes sense. Um, and then uh, Dr. Dr. Freeman, when, when someone is interacting, I mean, even now, just me with, with the questions and trying to phrase it, right? Because you don't wanna offend people, right? But, and I, I think for the most part though, people can tell if you're coming from, a place of you know well intent versus negativity um but what is a way to to have that con i mean i am of the school of like don't ask because you don't need to know unless someone tells you something like that but let's say you have a friend and um they are going through either hormones or just coming out with the changes like what's a great way to support them so that they feel like we are involved and care but also not overstepping our boundaries mm -hmm. um, the very first thing that we talked about right confirming what their pronouns are and ensuring that we are identifying them as such <clears throat> um and like i said not overstepping not overstepping your boundaries. If they want to implement you in their care, they will. Um, and if they don't, right, they will not. Um, and if you know about it, then it's, a, it's okay to ask questions um, that are not. Uh -oh. <laughs> There's some interference. Um, it's okay to ask questions. I, so as a queer woman as well, right? Um, in the community, I'm a lesbian. 
we all know this, last year, um, the one thing that we talk about is folks are afraid to ask. They don't know if they are being offensive or not. I'm gonna say that if it's a question that you, if someone asks you the question and you feel offended, right, then it's probably a question that doesn't need to be asked. But if it's a question that's genuinely, I wanna know because I wanna support you, um, then move forward with asking. No, that's great. Yeah, and I'm a big fan of communication. So um, I think as long as you're being respectful that there's not really um, too many ways that you can go wrong with that. Um, so reference all, right? So how we learn by asking. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Reverend Scott, is there anything else that you can think of that um, are ways where we can help support um, people in the, the LGBTQIA community? Um, I think one thing that's coming to mind is um, just kind of being mindful of the type of environments that we're creating, because I think some of it does have to do with terminology, it does have to do with the types of questions we ask, but I also think that we are, we tell people whether directly or indirectly, whether or not a space is safe enough for them and whether or not they'll be affirmed. And so I know that in different spaces that I'm in or work in, you know, I just wanna make sure that the whole environment feels um, like it would be safe for somebody to, to share information um, and to know that if they had a question or if they had a concern, they'd be able to ask. So um, we do things like put our pronouns in, in places we do things like um, we play with we play with stories we play with our liturgy we make sure that um, different gender identities and different sexual orientations are named in the service um, we name them in prayer we name them in things we're grateful for things that you know we have different types of families uh, that people see and so I think just exposing people and making it a regular part of whatever programming you have and having information around and resources also helps make people feel like if they ever needed to they could so yeah that's great I definitely love especially the part of exposing people to it more because I think a lot of times people like um it was either Queenie Dr. Freeman was saying before, like just the unknown, right? People are just afraid of the unknown and the more they interact with it, I think that fear goes away with it. And with that comes a little bit more acceptance. Um, Dr. Freeman, if you could, um, I guess the same question to you, if there's any other ways or ways that we can support the LGBTQIA community. Uh, now is perfect, right? Having these panels, um, open discussion, <clears throat> visibility and awareness, so right, I, I know that you all have a social media platform, so like post, folks go to social media, post in, post in, post in. Um, I wanna say Reverend Scott, I appreciate you and what you're doing um, in the church because folks are still, right, and religious and they want to feel safe and go to church. Um, I'm gonna say raised, I'm not, um, I, I don't necessarily identify as Christian, but I was raised right in the Baptist church. And we didn't talk about gender identity. We didn't talk about sexuality. So that seven-year-old girl that liked girls that had no idea what it was, and we just didn't talk about it. Those suicidal thoughts come in because you think something's wrong. I appreciate the work that you do um, because it's needed. Folks still want to pray and go to church and believe in God and and a lot of times they say, I don't go into church because they're very judgmental or they're not going to accept me. So thank you. Um, I'm sorry, I, I trailed off from the original question. <laughs> no, that's absolutely fine. And I'm glad you said all of that because I, I definitely agree as well. Um, could you repeat it though for me? I'm so sorry. No, it's fine. I was, just getting all of your, <laughs> I was just getting all of your opinions on ways that we could help support um, the LGBTQ yeah. yeah, community. I'm sorry. Yep having these panels, posting, um, safe space events, which are Queen and I are actually co-founders um, of the LGBTQ, the Newcastle County LGBTQ Youth Pride Festival, right? Where we want youth 
you've come to a safe space and they can be who they are. So having those safe space events and, and then community collaboration. Community collaboration is a big part. Absolutely. Thank you. And then Queen, um, do you have anything else to add? I sure do. Get involved. Get involved, right? Like I, I want to see people and bodies to get involved. Um, you get to a point where, you know, you can't just stay on the sideline and be a performative ally. Um, I think this panel for certainly, I, uh, actually, I'm going to connect NAMI to um, a Black trans woman who's leading a nonprofit in Kent County, um, Tiffany Fielder, um, and she's leading the First Day Outreach Center. Um, so really being able to be involved with um, individuals who are should continue to be pulled in and be part of these conversations, um, but really get involved, whether you're an ally, whether you're part of the community, get involved, be visible. The Wilmington, Newcastle County, the Wilmington, sorry, the Wilmington Pride Fest March is actually this Saturday at 10 a.m. Go and attend. There's Pride at Brandywine Zoo also this Saturday. Go and attend, right? Like um, there's Salisbury Pride. Go and attend in Salisbury, Maryland. So like attend, be visible, be verbal in your workplace, in your in your faith-based place. Like be visible. Um, it, and you know you could go a long way with being affirming, being nice to folks. Um, you know, show up and really be part of a community. Absolutely, I love that. Um, because set, putting together or fostering a sense of community, I think it helps you keep, stay involved. It makes you wanna be a part of things. And like, sometimes, especially if you feel like you're different or odd, like Dr. Freeman was saying, like you feel very isolating and that can lead to suicide ideation. So the more that I think that a community is built around them and around people finding people who are either going through the same thing or it's just accepting and loving of them uh, no matter what. Um, I think that that's very important. Um, and I can't thank you all so much for your time this evening, for coming on and um, answering a few of my questions. Uh, for those of you watching at home, so right now we'll um, be shutting off the recording, but we'll stay together um, in case anyone who is in the, in the audience wants to ask any questions. Um, but thank you so much for viewing this. We'll have links to all of their um, pages in the caption as well. And I hope you have a great evening.